Amen. And I pray that, that God is doing that in your life in some form or fashion in Bragtown as part of it. If you will, turn over to the back of your bulletin or the inside, I'm sorry, of your bulletin. There is um, one definite way to get involved, a new way that is taking place here. There is a sewing slash quilting group that is meeting on Wednesday afternoons at 1.30. And they are working on a project for Durham uh, Children's or Duke Children's uh, Hospital in which they make things for children that are having chemo for cancer. And so uh, what they are doing is really something that is integral in the part of the community and one way of sharing the love of Christ with those around us. I just want to make a couple other notes, the things that are not in the bulletin. I got a message from Buddy, I think this morning, letting me know that Jenny Clegg fell. Uh, please just be in prayer for her. There are several significant injuries from this fall. So I'm not sure if she's at, at the hospital receiving care still or where she's at, but be praying for her specifically first and foremost, and then take time to reach out, uh, whether you call her, or maybe stop by for a visit or send a card. And in that vein, those people that are in this church that are card warriors and those that maybe aren't and have a desire to send a card or two, I just set up a whole new card station right out here behind me on the table out there in the walkway between uh, the two entrances to the sanctuary. There are cards, envelopes, memory scripture verses, there are postcards, there's um, even things to stick on the back of the card to close it so you don't have to lick the envelope if that's one reason you don't send the card. Um, so that is there and waiting to be used. And I just encourage you to grab a card and drop a card in the mail to somebody this week. And then also next week, we're going to start signing up for small groups. And again, I, I hope that you're prayerfully considering how you can join a small group in the midweek. We'll have two that are offered during the day. I was just talking to dad about having his small group in McDonald's. So if food invigorates you or gets you motivated, then possibly consider that as an option. You can go get you a burger and a Bible study at the same time. But the Lord is at work here at Bragtown. I am super excited to see all that he is doing in and through this body of believers. And my prayer is that you will jump in and take a part into that, okay? So let's go to the Lord in prayer before Rich starts us off in worship. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Man, we are here to gather because of who you are, your magnificence, your truth, your grace that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. It has been imparted us to through the Bible. May we oh, just be ready to hear from you today that we would seek out the Savior that was sacrificed for us, that we would come together and worship this morning as one body united together by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we would be ready to engage with your word, that we would be excited to spend time in prayer, that our lips would not only praise your name, but sing of the joy that you've put in our hearts. May we not just sit here because this is what we do on Sunday morning, but that we would truly have a zeal for you, that we would chase after you with all of our being, that we would desire to know you more. Let that happen today during this time of worship. In your name I pray, amen. Let's stand.
Good morning. Eric, we hope you're feeling better. I think everybody probably knows that Eric's on round two of COVID and uh, we're just glad that you would come today. I'm sure you'd probably be better laying on the couch somewhere, but uh, thank you for being here. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Lord, we wanna thank you for letting us be here on a beautiful summer day. We want to ask you to be with friends and family that wish they could be here for reasons that they can't be for physical or any other reason. And we ask you to be with them. We ask you to 
take the offerings that you provided for us and that we give back so that you can use them in your church. In your name, amen. morning. Uh, so this morning's uh, scripture reading is in Psalm 119 verses 105 through 112. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and, and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees forever to the very end. Stand as we see Lamb of Glory.
I just want to throw a quick shout out to uh, those upstairs that are making audio and video possible this morning, as well as the choir. Just that wonderful uh, piece that y'all just did right there was amazing. And just reminds me of how I can't sing. And just, uh, <laughs> Carrie, Carrie is watching at home, and my watch is a smart watch, so it notifies me when I get things on my phone. And I look down at like 11.05, and she's like, hey, um, your mic is still on, and we can hear you singing over this live broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> I better turn this off, or we're going to lose all of our viewers for today. Uh, and again, just a reminder of why they do what they do, and I do what I do. It is a joy to be back in the pulpit today, and I'm thankful that I can be here today. The first part of the week was pretty rough, but I have gradually felt better every day. I definitely miss being able to go around to the community groups this morning and personally greet you guys. Uh, just know that you are welcome. I love you, and I'm glad that you're here today. Uh, that is one of the parts that I definitely uh, feel like I missed out on this morning. But nonetheless, I am glad that you're here, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the calls and prayers this week to provide encouragement and thoughts of care uh, is very meaningful to me. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we jump into his word this morning. Again, your word, Lord, is true. Uh, as Kim read, it is the light to our feet and the lamp to our path. And Lord, I'm just thankful for that. I'm thankful that we can come and open your word and know that we are reading truth and that your word is the key to wisdom for our lives. Now pray as we as call, our, call ourselves believers in Christ, that we would cherish the word that you have provided to us. Help that be a cornerstone for what we do as a Christian, that we are digging into your word, that we desire to be rooted in relationship with you, and a lot of that comes through knowing what your word says to us. Lord, may your word speak this morning to your people. May we have ears to hear and hearts that are receptive to the message. That you would get me out of the way, and Lord, would you speak to your people. Let them experience you today. May they be moved by the power of these words and what Jesus did in your house. May we have the same zeal that Jesus shows for your house today, for your house and your body of believers, because that is what your word commands us to do. And that's what we say we'll do when we say, yes, we will follow you, Jesus. All these things I pray in your name. Amen. So church, if you will, go ahead and grab your Bibles, open up to John chapter 2. And we're going to finish out John chapter 2 today. So we're going to pick up in verse 13 and read through the end of the chapter. Again, John chapter 2, it says in verse 13, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to the temple in Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the corns of the money changers and overturned the tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he said, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And now when he was in Jerusalem at the pa Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in men. And so I want y'all to think about that concept of zeal this morning. And what does zeal look like in your life? It means that you have great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause. And my prayer is that you have several different things in your life that produce zeal. But most importantly, your relationship with God and your part in his body should be the thing that drives the most zeal in your life. And that zeal for those things should then bleed down into everything else that you do, spurring you to have zeal for other things. And that may be a passion of yours that will uh, encourage or increase the, the livelihood of somebody else. Or it may be your service in the community because of your love for the Lord. 
Maybe it's your participation in a group such as the sewing group called Covered in Love. Because you love the Lord and you want to put your Lord's, the talent the Lord has put in you to work. But your zeal should produce something in your life. In Scripture, we see there's a disciple named Simon. He's often referred to as the zealot. And most people, I didn't know growing up why he was called the zealot. But he was very much full of zeal against the Roman Empire. That's what the zealots were. They were a group of people that got together and plotted how they could destroy the Roman Empire, how they could sneakily cause havoc for those around them that were for Rome. And so they would train. If you've seen The Chosen, season two has a really good depiction of what this looks like. They bring Simon into the the, uh, mix in the season two, and you see him training for these secret missions, much like Navy SEALs do in today's world. But they were crafted. They were very... uh, again, very devoted to their cause in order to to root out Roman rule. And so they would train in order to go on these kind of assassin missions in order to do harm to the Roman Empire. They were zealous for rooting out the Roman occupation. But then we see Jesus' zeal throughout his ministry. He had a zeal for worship. He had a true commitment to what the Father had called him to do. His zeal extended beyond cultural boundaries, so much so that he would reach into the lives of those that culture said, no, those are untouchables. We don't mess with that kind. We don't socialize with them. We don't commune with them. We don't fellowship with them. We don't even talk with them. But Jesus has such a deep, deep love for his father and for people that his zeal for people crossed over cultural boundaries. Another person that I thought about that many of y'all may know is Kevin Derby. He serves at North Durham Summit as one of their staff, but Kevin also has a zeal for coffee. He loves coffee, so much so that he roasts his own coffee now. You can go down to the Red and White. You can go to some other local businesses in this area, and they carry Derby Roasters coffee. So if you see that roaster, he is a Durham roaster that has a heart for the Lord and is using his heart for coffee to share the Lord through that. What is your zeal impacting in your life? Where is your zeal visible for other people to see. I challenge you to think about that today because Jesus puts his zeal on full display for the Jews and the Gentiles in the temple of that day to see that he loved the Lord. He loved the Lord's house. He loved his father and he made it evident for everybody else around him to see. And so we pick up Jesus saying in verse 13 or John telling us in in verse 13 that the Passover was taking place. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. You see, they had been in Capernaum or Capernaum, and they were doing ministry there. He was in Cana for the wedding. And so him and his disciples transitioned to Jerusalem because much like the Muslim uh, season of Ramadan in which they make a pilgrimage, many Jews, or most Jews really, were required to make that pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. We don't see that happening as much today, but there are still many people that travel to Jerusalem for this Passover feast. This was common for any Jewish male above the age of 18 was their job or one of their roles as a believer in God was to travel to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover. So we see Jesus doing this, and it's not just a little event that is taking place in Jerusalem, but there is a lot of people in Jerusalem for the Passover weekend. It is a highly trafficked area in which many people come from around the city of Jerusalem and the outskirts of this city to come and celebrate the Passover with one another. And you see a big part of Passover was bringing sacrifices. You had to bring a sacrifice in order to to participate in this Passover meal. But you see, people were traveling and they didn't necessarily want to pack the lamb with everything else or pack the goat. It wasn't the easiest thing to bring. You already got bringing your family, you're bringing excuse me, (coughs) they're bringing other things with them. They didn't necessarily want to pack the animals. And so it just became much easier for the Jews to be able to get animals for sacrifice at the temple. I watched one time in Haiti. I spent a summer down in Haiti many years ago. And again, Haiti is a very different culture than what we have here. It's totally different. In which people oftentimes buy their animals and then take their animals home and slaughter them. And so I literally watched Buses go down the street with goats with their legs tied together, hanging out the side of a bus window because that person needed to take that goat home. And so 
it is not the easiest thing to do. We're thankfully we don't go down to the store and buy our live animals and bring them home and then prepare them. We can go and buy nicely packaged meat. And so, again, thinking about these people didn't want to bring extra animals. They just slowed them down. It wasn't that feasible. It didn't look fun in Haiti, nor would I think it would be fun today, even with our modern technology, much less 2,000 years ago in Jesus' day, to bring the sacrificial animals. And so in order to capitalize off of this, there were people that were selling and trading in the temple. They were meeting a need of the people, but at the same time, they were sacrificing something that was hugely important, and that was the temple environment. And you see Jesus come in, and he sees what's going on. And he's not happy. I can imagine you can see the anger kind of building up in him and a recognition that, hey, I'm going to do something about this because this is not right. This is not what the temple was made for. And this is not what should be taking place in my father's house. And so what did he do? He fashioned a whip. and He drove the people out. Many of you may have experienced something of this nature growing up. Maybe you were outside with your parents and you did something wrong. And your dad's anger was kindled, or maybe your mom's anger was kindled quickly. They didn't waste the time of saying, oh, I will take care of this later. They probably pulled a switch off the tree and took to it, or maybe got a belt off their waist and took to it. Whatever they did, they needed to fix the problem quick. I heard stories a few, or last week at camp of these two older gentlemen sharing those uh, switch stories with me. It wasn't a joke, but it was quick to happen, and it left, left an indelible mark. It wasn't going to be any delay in taking care of the issues at hand. Neither was it for Jesus at this point in time. He drove out quickly what he deemed as unholy in the temple. He wasn't going to have it. He made a point in what many people would call righteous anger. Several times throughout Jesus' ministry, you can see him getting riled up. He is upset, but he's not upset at any run-of-the-mill type things that upset us many times. But he is upset over things that go against his father, that are unholy, that are unrighteous, and he's going to deal with them. He recognized the temple was a place of worship, but yet it had become a place for people to sell and to make money. He knew the temple had a specific reason, and it was not for this. And he wanted to get rid of it real quick. One of the things that I think that really bothered him about this was the fact that they were raising prices. They were taking advantage of their own people. We complain about inflation today. We see gas prices being high. We see the prices going up everywhere. But can you imagine going into the temple and having to buy your sacrificial animal at double the cost because they wanted to take advantage of you? It was real inflation. It was unjust inflation. And Jesus did not like what was happening. And so he made a point again to get rid of it. And that infuriated the people there at the temple. They weren't happy with Jesus coming in again and asserting his authority. The priests and the scribes, those people that that oversaw what took place at the temple were obviously okay with this going on. I probably would imagine they may have even got kickback of some of this, that it probably filled their pockets to a certain degree. And so they questioned Jesus. They looked at him and said, what sign? Give us a sign for you doing this. Why do you have the right to come in here and kick these people out? They wanted to know who Jesus was and why he was doing what he was, was doing. And I talked to you all about the week, several weeks ago that skeptics are always going to be looking for a reason to try Jesus. Who are you really? Give us a sign. Prove yourself to us. We don't believe who you are. And so Jesus said, well, look, I'll tell you the truth. This temple you're looking at, this temple that you're in, this temple that you're worshiping in, that you're doing business in, I could tear this temple down and rebuild it in three days. Again, they didn't have any idea what he was talking about. Again, y'all got to remember, this is very early in Jesus' ministry. He had just turned water to wine. He was just now starting to make himself known and yet not fully known. And so he gives this kind of this statement that doesn't necessarily make sense to them. It's kind of like an early parable. And he says, well, look, no. What are you talking about, man? I don't know who you are, and you're telling me that you're going to tear this temple down and build it in three days? It took us 46 years to build this temple, and it was still ongoing at that day. There were still renovations and additions being added onto the temple. What Jesus said sounded ludicrous to them, 
It did not make sense. It did not register. They had a sense of cluelessness. It didn't fully comprehend what Jesus was trying to say. You see, again, this was the first time Jesus cleansed this temple. Most of the Gospels report a temple cleansing when he comes back to Jerusalem before the crucifixion. Many scholars will believe that there are two temple cleansings, that this one, the first one here in John that nobody else reports, and then the one at the end of Jesus' ministry. And evidently, they didn't get it. Jesus drove them out, but I imagine that they were back before long. They didn't understand what Jesus was trying to show. But he, this was his chance, just like at the wedding in Canaan, where he looked at his mother and said, Mom, it's not time. It's not my time yet. But then he went ahead and did something anyway to demonstrate his godliness. Here, too, he points out, look, three days, three days, and I'll rebuild the temple. He's alluding to his resurrection, but obviously at this point in time, nobody gets that. Nobody understands that Jesus is this Messiah that's going to be crucified and raised again after three days and that his, his death and resurrection was going to start something wholly new, not only for the Israelites, but for the Gentiles and the rest of the known world. He starts to reveal the value in himself and not the temple. Do we recognize that too, church? That even if we came back and this church was leveled, completely burnt to the ground or completely destroyed for whatever reason, he lives on because he is more valuable than any building or any temple. And that's what he was trying to get the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders to start a shift in their mentality that it's not about the temple. It's not about where you worship, but who you worship. And we're going to see this put on front and center display when he meets the woman at the well in chapter four in a few weeks. Because Jesus wants her to recognize too that there is something living and breathing in him. It is about a man and a relationship with him and not about a place to come and make sacrifices. Recognize that, that Jesus knows. Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus knows more than anything that we can ever understand. And this is just a glimpse of his omniscience. We talked about that the other day with Nathaniel. And Nathaniel said, well, how in the world do you know who I am? And he said, I saw you. I saw you under the fig tree. And that alone was enough to compel Nathaniel to say, I believe in you. You are the Messiah. Jesus held this special talent that nobody else has. He sees in the men's minds. He sees in the men's hearts. And if that doesn't make you quake with fear, it ought to. It ought to show you that even in our sinful nature and our heart, Jesus knows there's nothing that we can hide. We can't go into a dark corner of our house or a dark corner in our mind, a dark corner in our life, and expect Jesus not to see. He knew what was going on in the hearts of men. They were questioning him. They were skeptical of who he was and why he was coming to the temple to assert his authority. And then for him to say, I'll tear down this temple that you built in 46 years and rebuild it in three days, how is that possible? There is no way. But then some people say, well, no, I do believe you. I do believe the signs that you're doing. Maybe they heard about his turning water into wine. Maybe they've heard that this Messiah has, has come, and John the Baptist is saying, you need to follow him, because remember, he's the son of God. He is the lamb of God. Go after him. And so I bet there's some things that are circulating and people are starting to get curious. And people are saying, hey, look, I think that I want to believe in you. You seem like maybe you're legit. But Jesus, again, knows what's deep down inside. People can praise and people can be attracted by what goes on in the world around us. They see some acts, they hear something about something, and they're quick to jump on the bandwagon. And first glances, y'all, can be deceiving. We can be tricked by looking at something from the outside and it looks impressive, but when we really get down to it, we miss the big picture of things. Or maybe it looked good originally, but ultimately it was really bad. But there's also times in which we can catch a sight of something and know it's real. I think these people were catching a sight of Jesus and just looking at the works that he was doing, the miracles that he was producing, the commotion that he caused at the temple. It was something new, something different. And don't we love something new and something different? They were quite ready to tag along with him. But Jesus says, nope, nope, 
I see your heart and your heart's not in the right place. And so I'm not going to reveal myself to you in fullness. I'm not going to give you all of me just yet. My time has not yet come and I will eventually reveal who I am to you when you are ready to accept it and ready to follow and ready to believe, not because of what you see, but what you believe, what you believe to be true. And so I want to challenge you this morning, church, to think about your zeal and your heart. And the fact that Jesus is looking down into your zeal and your heart, what is he seeing? Does he see this zeal that he should be producing in each one of us? Again, Jesus does not call us to a lukewarm faith. He is pretty clear about that in Revelation where he speaks to the church and says, hey, look, you guys are just lukewarm. Y'all run neither hot nor cold. And this lukewarmness in you makes me want to vomit you out of my mouth, makes me want to spit you out because it is gross to me. God does not call us to a lukewarm faith, church. He doesn't call us to be a fence sitter. We don't get to sit on the fence and say, well, I'll play Christianity today, but over here and over here and over here, I'll do whatever I want to do. I'll live my sin out loud over here, but I will be a Christian here and I will stay on the fence and I will decide which side I want to be on, whatever one is the most comfortable at that given time. That is not what we're called out to be. We're called out to be on fire for Christ. We're supposed to have a zeal for Jesus. As we continue to absorb this kind of vision and mission for Bragtown, those three key statements that we've been talking about for the last year, being rooted in Christ, being disciple makers, and being kingdom movers. All three of those things have an element of action behind it. Rooted, first and foremost, means that we are rooted in Jesus, that we understand who Jesus is, and we are actively trying to grow our relationship with him. Roots must be alive and moving in order to absorb nutrients. There must be growth there. I went outside yesterday, and we have a dogwood that decided not to bloom this year. Don't know whatever reason it was, but I went out there and, and finally decided to, to wiggle the tree. I broke some branches off to see if there was any green in it, and there was none. So I bent the tree backwards and to the side, and what do you think happened? The roots just disintegrated. They just broke because the roots were dead. The roots were doing nothing functional for that tree. The tree was, in essence, not really rooted. So I twisted it and turned it just a little bit. With very minimal effort, I pulled the tree right out of the ground and threw it on the pile to burn. Where are your roots at, church? Are your roots active and alive? Or if the devil comes and shakes you and twists you a little bit, will he find that you're really not rooted at all, that you're rooted in something other than Christ, and he can just pluck you right out of the ground and do what he wants to do with you? God's word is clear. It says that, those that are not rooted in him, those that are not abiding in the vine will be chopped off and put into the burn pile. Church, be rooted. I cannot encourage you more to make sure your relationship with Christ is deepening every day. And as that is rooted, then that should produce a zeal in you for Christ's work. We are disciple makers, not disciple watchers, not disciple sitters, not just disciple hopefuls. We are disciple makers. That means we are actively pouring into people's lives, desiring them to look more like Christ. To take what Christ is doing as we're being rooted and then putting it into somebody else's life so we can enhance their rootedness. I put up two graphics this week, one back here on the board and one downstairs next to the class called the Discipleship Process. Take some time to look at those graphics and see where you are as a disciple maker. Ultimately, we want to get away from not being saved in that chasm of lostness and out of the infanthood of growing and being on baby's milk to growing ourselves and then to pouring into others and then looking back in your age. Not that you're not disciple making anymore, but you can look back at people that you spent time discipling and those people are discipling other people. And you can trace your discipleship lineage from the person you discipled to somebody they discipled and then somebody they discipled. Can you do that? Can you sit and think about those that you've poured into? You've got to be makers of disciples. It takes action. It takes zeal. It takes excitement to do that. And then being movers. Movers, again, has an element of action. Something isn't just going to move idly. You have to move it. 
the kingdom of God by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through his people can be a kingdom mover. We are charged to be that here at Bragtown. It's why we explore so many opportunities within our community. It's why we open our doors to multiple groups because it takes movement in order for the kingdom to grow. It takes engagement in people and in company, or not companies, but groups in order to let the gospel flourish. And maybe not all things are going to be as fruitful as we hope. But if we continue to seek out ways to be kingdom-minded in our community, the Lord is going to work. I believe it. We're asking him to work, and we are putting energy and effort into making movements around us, and he is going to work in and through those things. Church, I want to close with this. Carrie came up to me earlier this week, and she's like, hey, I was reading a passage in Exodus, one of the most thrilling books in the Bible. You've read it, go read it. If you haven't read it lately, go read it. But it's about the tabernacle and all the different dimensions of the tabernacle and how the Israelites were going to need to build the tabernacle a specific way. And so they got the tabernacle built, and Moses calls out to the Israelites and says, hey, look, Israelites, you need to bring your time and your talents and your treasures into this tabernacle. And what did the people of God do? Man, they brought in abundance. They brought treasure to the tabernacle for the work and the glory of God to be done. And not only did they bring treasure, those people that were talented in building, in craftsmanship, in sewing, in dyeing, they all brought their talent in and helped improve what was going on the tabernacle. So much so, there was so much abundance, Moses had to say, whoa, 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 slow your roll, people. Y'all are bringing more than what we can handle. But man, wouldn't that be awesome if it happened here? And we continue to pour out the blessings that God has given us back into his work here. If those that are sitting here, and there's people in this congregation that I know are blessed with talents, talents that I don't have, but you're sitting on them. You're not using them for God's glory. Even when you're being asked to use those talents that I know you have, say no. Let God use you. Let God implore you to do things with zeal for his kingdom. Are you living that out for God's glory and not our own? A lot of times we hinder it because we're scared, we're fearful, or we don't want to get in front of people, or we don't feel like we have the time. It's not about us. It's about God. It's about giving the glory back to God. It's allowing God to cultivate what he is already giving you. He just asks that you do so with good stewardship. We see in that example the, the Israelites using the talent that God had given them in so many wonderful ways to glorify him. Their zeal was evident. So much slow, Moses had to say, slow down. And let us, let us walk with zeal, church. Let us be about God's work. Let us not sit idly waiting for God to work. If God is going to move, he's going to move through us. And that requires us moving. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your challenging word. Thank you for sometimes even giving us things that make us uncomfortable. Lord, I know time and time again, I've heard your word and it has made me uncomfortable. It has called me out and said, Eric, you need to do more than what you are doing. You have a gift that I want you to use and you need to be obedient. Lord, call your people unto you. Call this church unto you that we may be your messengers. Whether it's here on Sunday morning as part of worship or if it's actively engaged in the community around us sharing the love of Christ with others. That we would be active evangelists, active missionaries each and every day of our lives that we would ask for opportunities to declare your name, to tell others of your goodness, to share our salvation story because you have made such an impact in our life. Lord, bring revival to Bragtown, not only this church, but this community. Bring revival to Durham. It can only come through the truth of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. Again, Rich is going to lead us in a closing invitation. 
I'm not going to be down front this morning, but I encourage you, if you've got something in your heart to pray about, if you feel like the Lord is tugging on you, then bring it before the altar. Ask him to give you the power and the ability, the zeal to do what he's calling you to do. Amen.